for coming out tonight. Uh, welcome to the Ashtimo branch of the Kalamazoo Public Library. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Eli Rubin, who is a professor of history at Western Michigan University, and his primary area of study is Germany. So let's give him a hand, and he's going to talk to us tonight about the Holocaust in general. But he's got some specific things to say, so let's welcome him. Yeah, I wanted to thank, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? So, okay. Um, good. I, um, I wanted to thank Angela, first of all, for reaching out and inviting me and, and Kalamazoo Public Library. It's, um, it's really an honor to be here with you um, tonight. Um, uh, and uh, again, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Eli Rubin. I teach at Western Michigan University. I've uh, been doing research and writing about German history for almost 20 years, um, and so, um, and I teach uh, a range of courses, but I also teach about the Holocaust, and so, you know, it's a, it's an honor to be here, this is a solemn occasion, um, but um, it's a chance to reflect and to delve into the deeper meaning of the Holocaust, um, and that's important because, you know, the Holocaust was an event that was so horrendous uh, and so massive on its scale that it sometimes seems to be impossible to wrap your mind around it. Even now, 73 years after, after the event, even after there's been countless studies and documentaries, museums, websites, films, um, even for historians like me, especially for historians like me, uh, the breadth and the depth of the violence and the horror of the Holocaust is it's like an onion, the layers of which we continue to peel back we need to find more layers, and more layers, and more layers. But the task is still so vital to continue doing this, more so today than any time in the past. We see the very same forces of ethno-nationalism, which rose to dominance in Europe in the 1930s, which led to the takeover of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party in Germany, once again ascendant. Our state, in a month's time, will be visited by perhaps the most recognized leader of this new movement, Richard Spencer. Go to the next slide. Um, we'll be joining, uh, uh, we'll be speaking at Michigan State <coughs> University, um, as if Michigan State didn't have enough going on already. <laughs> Too soon. Um, and of course, you only need to go drive up to Michigan State on March, I think March 5th, to see this phenomenon for yourself in, in real life. Of course, if the idea of being caught between uh, neo-Nazi alt-rightists, Antifa protesters, and heavily armed police at MSU doesn't exactly sound like your idea of a good time, you don't have to do that. You can simply just peek into the political dynamics of almost any country in Europe right now. The UK, of course, famously enacted Brexit, um, which was largely um, uh, driven by a desire to keep foreigners out of its borders. Marine Le Pen came very close to winning the presidency of France last year, which would have certainly meant the end of the European Union. The European Union was set up in the wake of the horrors of World War II by France and West Germany to ensure mutual cooperation and open borders so that nothing like World War II would ever happen again. Um, in Austria, a far-right ethno-nationalist came within less than a one percentage point of becoming the chancellor. And in Germany, a new party, the Alternative for Germany, the AFD, um, has risen to prominence out of nothing that didn't even exist two years ago because of Chancellor Angela Merkel's response uh, or embrace of Syrian and Iraqi refugees. In Poland, in Turkey, in Hungary, and of course in Russia, we've seen strongly nationalist and even ethno-nationalist regimes take and solidify their control. Recently in Warsaw, Poland, of all places, one of the epicenters of the Holocaust, uh, last year, November uh, 2017, we saw 60,000 nationalists and neo-Nazis um, Polish neo-Nazis demonstrate um, using flares instead of torches, but essentially reenacting many of the scenes from the past. 
And so, it's vital. It's more vital than ever to try to carry on the work of understanding the causes of the Holocaust. And so, that's what I'd like to bring you all into this work um, this evening. And so, since I mentioned Poland, let's start in Poland, in a town in eastern Poland called Yedwabne. Um, Yedwabne is a, a, a small town of about 2,500 people in the early 1940s. Um, it lay in the eastern part of Poland in the so-called Pale of Settlement. Pale of Settlement was an area stretching from the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia down through eastern Poland, western Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, down to the Black Sea where Jews were historically allowed to settle in the Russian Empire and found the, um, the heaviest concentration of Jews in, in Europe. Um, and so, like many of these towns scattered throughout the, the farmlands and the marshlands of eastern Poland, Yedwabne had a very strong Jewish presence. In fact, out of its 2,500 inhabitants, 1,500 of them, two-thirds, were Jews. So, in August 1939, in preparation for the beginning of World War II, Hitler and Stalin signed a non-aggression treaty, promised not to attack each other. That was made public. There was a secret clause to the treaty that was not made public, which was an agreement between the USSR and the Third Reich to carve up Poland, arranging the borders in advance of how they would divide Poland. And so you can, you can see the um, Yedwabne um, is in the, fell in just across the border into the, the predetermined Soviet occupation zone. So, and the USSR um, was also granted control of the Baltic states, um, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, and Finland. So when the war started on September 1st, of course, we're very familiar with the scene of German troops and tanks rolling across the, the border with um, Poland. But um, at the same time, Soviet troops rolled across the border from the other side um, and took control of the eastern part of Poland. Um, and when they occupied Yedwabne, uh, as everywhere else, they installed, they began installing a Soviet regime. They put up a huge statue of Lenin um, and began instituting their Soviet political economic system. Some of the residents welcomed them. And a few of the, the residents who welcomed the Soviets were Jews. Um, most of the town's residents simply kept their heads down including most of the Jews, um, and tried not to get noticed or arrested by the Soviet regime. Um, Poles in particular were afraid of the Soviets. Stalin, who was well known, had a deep and enduring hatred of Polish people. He saw them, them as more of an enemy than the Germans. Um, the USSR and Poland had already fought a war once in 1921. Poland, uh, for many centuries, had been under the oppressive and cruel control of the Russian Empire. And um, when the Soviets invaded, they began rounding up anyone in Poland they thought would be a threat to them, including um, officers of the Polish army. They famously uh, murdered 20,000 officers in a forest known as Kitin. And many other Poles deemed threats were sent to Siberia to work in the Gulag and were never heard from again. Others, including large property owners, were expropriated, their lands taken and redistributed. Then, 22 months later, in June of, um, of 1941, Hitler surprised Stalin by breaking the non-aggression pact and invading Soviet territory. The Soviet forces were unprepared and they were in disarray, and they withdrew from their positions hastily, leaving their equipment and their papers behind. For many in Eastern Europe who had lived and sometimes often suffered under the Soviets, there was a moment of liberation after the Soviets <coughs> left. And then it was followed by an eerie calm, knowing that the Germans would soon arrive. What would that be like? Would it be worse than the Soviets? Better? <coughs> Everyone knew that the Germans were on a mission to wipe out the Jews and the Bolsheviks, the, the Soviet communists. These thoughts ran through the conversations of townspeople throughout Eastern Europe, um, Eastern Poland and the Baltics, along with another thought, a point that historian Timothy Snyder has emphasized recently, which was in this brief period in July, late June, July of 1941, in places like Yedwabne, there was no government. 
Polish state had been destroyed by the Soviet Union, and then the Soviet Union withdrew, and the Germans had not yet arrived. It was like a period of anarchy um, and lawlessness. And this was how it was experienced by the people of Yedpavne. Within five days of the Soviet withdrawal, the Polish townspeople began killing their Jewish neighbors. And I should um, backtrack here and just say that this research comes from the work done by a Princeton historian of Polish descent named Jan Gross whose work has been extremely controversial in Poland. The things I'm going to tell you, number one, um, come from his research. Uh, number two, are um, graphic and disturbing to listen to. And number three, are um, hotly contested, especially by the forces of the, the alt-right or neo-right, or whatever you want to call it, in Poland, which largely control most of the government. He has been disinvited and called a traitor, um, and um, uh, and yet I think that there's enough corroborating evidence for what he has, excuse me, found <clears throat> to back up what he's saying, which is why I'm conveying it to you. And then we'll talk about some other um, disturbing, controversial, but important um, research on the Eastern Front. So again, and Gross um, admits that there is some discrepancy in the eyewitness accounts. Um, but he concludes, and I think he's right, that when the killing began, there were no Germans yet in Yedvabne. They A few score of officers arrived with a gendarmerie, a sort of um, a, like a county uh, military police uh, units um, in trail. Um, later in the day of July 5th, 1941, um, the killing began as a group of young Polish men began rounding up Jews with clubs and whips to march them to the public square and to uh, make, them, um, make them begin cleaning the, the, the town square. Can you go back a couple slides? This is a grainy photograph of the town square with the, the village church um, there and the first German units arriving. Um, actually, no, this is from the five days later. They, they are already stationed here. This is after the events I'm describing. And this is 10th of, of July, 1941. And if you can go forward one. Again, the, um, the Jews of Yedvabne were like the Jews of um, a lot of these Polish towns. Um, to some degree, they were uh, traditional and wore traditional garb um, and set themselves apart by speaking Yiddish, um, <coughs> going to separate schools, and so on. But others dressed very much like uh, Poles. They wore suits and ties. They didn't wear beards. Um, they tried as much as possible to blend into Polish society. They spoke Polish. Um, some also spoke German. So, um, as the um, uh, as they be and uh, as they began to uh, as the the young Polish men began to round them up and take them to the public square, um, beating them and whipping them on the way. Um, the first deaths occurred. Um, a, a young man was beaten to death inside a house. And it appears that once the, some of the leaders of the pogrom, using the word pogrom because it's an Eastern European word which means um, a violent mob, but as we'll see, uh, that attacks Jews, but as we'll see, this is worse than um, old-fashioned old pogroms. Once the leaders of this pogrom got a taste of blood, their appetite was whetted. Um, they grabbed a young Jewish woman and cut her head off and kicked it around um, in a game of soccer. Another young woman was killed clutching her infant to her, and the infant was also killed. The mob began working, Jan Gross writes, at a frenetic pace once they decided to kill all the Jews in town and realized uh, what, you know, what a great task lay in front of them to kill all 1,500. Um, once the Germans arrived, the mob uh, approached them and asked them for firearms so that they could do the job more quickly, and the Germans were not about to give Polish uh, people firearms, uh, so they said no. Um, instead, the Germans stayed off to the side and took pictures of the carnage, amused. This meant that the Poles had to kill in whatever ways were available to them. They used knives, they used clubs, and they used stones. They led the Jews to the swamps outside of town and held them under until they drowned. Um, a man named Stanislav uh, Shelava tortured his victims, slicing their tongues out before disemboweling them with a meat hook. A witness hiding in some bushes nearby saw, uh, claimed that he saw 28 Jews killed by Shalava in this way. As all mass murderers learn, learn sooner or later, 
um, the Germans included, one-to-one -one killing is impossibly inefficient to reach the goal of complete eradication. So the mob gathered together and um, uh, thought of a plan. They needed a barn. They asked a farmer named Josef Krzynowski for his, and he refused. So they told him to help them chase the Jews to the barn of his neighbor, Bronislav Slizinski, who was not home at the time, nor was his son. On the way to Slizinski's barn, the Jews were forced to carry pieces of the Lenin statue that the mob had smashed that same day and forced to chant, the war is because of us. <clears throat> Once they were herded into the barn, at this point, well over a thousand of them still, the doors were bolted and the barn was doused in kerosene and set on fire. As the flames rose, some of the Jews were able to force, back, uh, force the back doors open, but as soon as they fled outside, they met an axe-wielding pole named Stashek Silava. Um, only one Jew, uh, a boy named Yannick Neumark, escaped. The screams of the victims could be heard and the smell of the burning flesh could be smelled for miles around. After the fire, the Polish onlookers were eager to get at the smoldering and charred bodies to pocket any belongings, mainly jewelry, that the victims had died with. It was at this point that the German officers and their men intervened, angrily ordering the, the Polish townspeople to clean up the mess they had made. They said, quote, so you've managed to kill and burn lots of Jews, eh? But you don't feel like cleaning up the bodies. Get to work. All the corpses need to be disposed of immediately. It was a hot day in July in Poland. Dogs were starting to uh, eat and carry off limbs from the um, charred bodies. The Poles set about the task, which was extremely difficult because as the over a thousand victims clung to each other as they burned, their charred and melted bodies fused with each other. Poles, who hours before had been drunk with wild pleasure and listening to the sounds of hundreds of their neighbors burning alive, now had to come down from their high and back to earth. They had to cut and rip the bodies into small pieces and throw them into a big pit all the rest of that sweltering day and into the night. Still, the instigators of the mob found the day to be a very big success. One of the main leaders of the mob at the barn, a villager named uh, Kobrzniecki, bragged about it to friends later, claiming that he was the one who thought of the idea. He was the one that doused the barn in kerosene, and additionally, he had personally stabbed 18 Jews that day. To go forward, one more so this is good. So this is a memorial in Yedvabne, you can see on the outskirts of the town, to um, the Jews who were murdered there on the site of, uh, of the barn, um, and um, it contains a piece of the burned barn uh, door. Go for it, one more. This is the Slizinski barn. You can see the, the contours of the barn. Go for it, one more. And of course, as soon as this was, well, not as soon, but almost as soon as this was put up, it was vandalized um, with, um, it's a little hard to see it there, spray paint saying in Polish, they were flammable and swastikas all over the memorial. Um, there were Jews, of course, that tried to escape the town. But as you can see, it's a small town located in a rural area. Jews didn't have access to horses, generally speaking, whereas the townspeople, the Polish townspeople often did. So running across the open fields, Poland itself comes from the word polio, which means field. It's a very flat, open country, um, and uh, they uh, were easily tracked down um, and brought back to town to be killed. Some made it to neighboring villages only to find that all the other Jews there had also been killed. There was no safe place to go. Um, many, of the Col many of the Poles who engaged in the killing then quickly ransacked the dead Jews' homes, carrying off any property, valuables, or livestock that they could carry. Um, indeed, the lust and the envy for Jewish wealth in Poland and in Russia and elsewhere had long been a motivating factor for the groms of the past. And usually, over the centuries, Jewish communities uh, learned that they could save up money in a communal fund to buy off mobs when they were drunken and angry and out for blood. And that usually worked to limit the damage. This time it didn't. There was no buying off of the um, of of the mob. 
usually also in past times when mobs got angry and began to rampage through Jewish villages, there was some higher authority to which the Jews could, um, could uh, avail themselves, either a local uh, lord or a prince um, or a priest, um, or even in the Soviet Union, a, 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 a political commissar. But here again, as Snyder notes, there was no government. There was no one to whom they could, um, they could appeal for help. In fact, um, the, only the, the few of the Jews who were saved that day um, were saved by some of the German gendarmerie, the, the soldiers who pulled them into the um, pulled them into the, the makeshift mess hall that the German troops had set up for themselves. There were, I should add, there were a few Ger uh, Poles in the town who sheltered Jews themselves. Um, not all Poles, not all people in Yedvabne were, were engaged at this. Um, but um, for the Poles, with the Germans really the only authority in town, they knew that the Germans hated the Jews. If they knew nothing else about Germany and why Germany was there, they knew one thing. Everybody knew one thing about the Germans, and that's that they wanted the Jews dead. And so, many of them did what they did because they were hoping to get on the Germans' good side by doing their work for them. The fact that the Germans would later go on to victimize and murder many of these same Poles, and in fact, in other parts of the country, were doing that as this was happening in Yedvabne, did not seem to spark any sense of solidarity among the Poles with the Jews, the Germans' other targets. And that's one of the things that's most shocking about some of the more recent research on the Holocaust, like Rose's work, is just how many times this example repeated itself throughout Eastern Europe. From Estonia to the Ukraine, local townspeople actively assisted in killing the Jews that they had lived with and alongside for centuries. In some cases, such as in Yedvabne, townspeople simply turned on their Jewish neighbors, clubbing and stabbing and burning them while the Germans arrived and looked on in amusement. In others, locals volunteered for auxiliary uh, military units that the Germans hastily formed to help them in the task of shooting, rounding up and shooting Jews so that the Germans wouldn't have to do the shooting themselves. And we see this um, everywhere we look throughout the Holocaust. Ordinary people doing the work of the Germans for them. In the death camps, most of the actual work of hurting the Jews, you can report, of hurting the Jews into the gas chambers, unlocking the doors behind them, then removing the corpses, their skin turned uh, rosy pink from the hydrogen cyanide gas, which had just killed them, their limbs rigid and entangled, was not a task done by the SS or any German officials. That was left up to um, special command units known as Zonderkommando, many of them made out of Jews. This is one of the few uh, photographs that was smuggled out of Auschwitz um, to the resistance to hopefully get the Western allies to intervene sooner to save Jewish lives. It didn't work. Um, but this is a, a Jewish Sonderkommando disposing of bodies um, because uh, the crematoria weren't able to keep up uh, with them. So they, they would burn them in big piles on, on uh, grates of, uh, of iron rails to sort of catch the fat dripping so they could use it to save kerosene as more fuel. Um, in fact, the SS rarely even entered Auschwitz. They rarely entered any of the death camps or concentration camps. Um, their barracks were outside the walls of Auschwitz. They brought their families to live with them, you know, the kindergarten, restaurants, um, and many of the families were totally unaware of what was happening um, right nearby the camps. The wife of Franz Stangel, who was the commandant of Treblinka um, extermination camp, um, lived in a nice house right near the camp, had no idea what her, what her husband actually did until one day a drunken subordinate of her husband dropped by and ordered the whole thing out to her. And she was horrified and confronted her husband and um, her response um, to his admission of what he, his job really was, was to not have sexual relations with him for a long time after that. You know, it, was, it was the other inmates who kept order and kept discipline in the camps. Um, many of these were known as capos. They were deputized by the SS 
um, to, uh, to do this, and the SS would oftentimes select them because they were um, known to be murderers or sadists or, or um, rapists or in some other way um, well-suited towards being cruel to other, other people. Um, but sometimes they simply found people willing to, to keep discipline and keep order um, uh, for the SS in the camps. Um, the SS didn't want to venture into the camps. They were afraid of disease. Um, in fact, uh, even hardened SS leaders who actually went inside the camps were shocked by what confronted them. Heiner Himmler was the, um, we'll talk about a little bit later, was the, the head of the SS, the really one, one of the few ones truly responsible for all of this, we only visited a gas chamber once. Um, and to see it in operation. And he vomited all over his pristine black SS uniform. Um, he couldn't handle the sight of it. Um, you know, but mainly the SS did not go into the camps because they didn't have to. They had created a situation, a system, in which groups were pitted against each other in, desperate, in a desperate and life-threatening situation, which, except for a few exceptions, there were some, some acts of resistance, um, prevented groups from seeing their fates as linked, and prevented them from creating solidarity and a united front, uh, which would have allowed them to act in unison and overwhelm the much smaller number of their captors. Okay, it was a situation with a few hundred guards and hundreds of thousands of inmates. Similarly, in the ghettos to which Jews were consigned in European cities prior to their de deportation to death camps, the Nazis rarely, if ever, entered. Again, this was because of a fear of disease, but and also possibly of being ambushed, as did in fact happen in Warsaw in the ghetto in 1943. But like in the camps, it was mostly because they didn't have to. It was Jews themselves who kept order for the Germans in the ghettos in the form of the Jewish police. The Jewish, and, the, and led by the Jewish councils that kept order. These units did uh, the bidding including, when called upon, rounding up the other Jews to be deported on trains to their deaths. In exchange, they received better rations, and better rations could be life-saving in this situation. The standard food rations weren't enough to keep a person alive for more than a half a year. Um, and they were also spared deportation until they weren't. They usually were the last to go on the trains. Um, most of them didn't survive the war either. And of course, we've learned that ordinary Germans, ordinary Lithuanians, ordinary Poles, ordinary French men and women, etc., participated in the Holocaust in so many other ways, including assisting with deportations, informing on Jews who were in hiding, or even actively posing as someone that des desperate Jews could trust, promising them forged documents or safe passage, um, only to collect money from the Jews and then betray them to the, stop to, to the Gestapo also for money, to get paid on both ends. In some cases, Jews themselves were employed by the Gestapo to lure other Jews out of hiding and then turn them in to, um, to the, the concentration camps. It was in this way that the SS and the Gestapo and the other allied police um, order units that we'll talk about, which um, uh, were numerically much, much smaller um, could keep order uh, over tens and you know, hundreds of thousands, ultimately millions of, pe of people. So <clears throat> I'll, as I will submit to you, that this is a very, very important lesson to take away from the Holocaust, that we can and that we should and we must apply to today's current climate. The SS was relatively small in number. Um, even once they developed the gas chambers and got them up to full capacity in late 42, in early 1943, they still could not have killed 12 million people on their own, nor could they have managed a massive concentration camp system that contained tens of millions of people throughout Europe, while also coordinating the ghettoization, the hunting, and the deportation of Jews and other undesirables, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, Roma and Sinti, um, and others, throughout occupied Europe. There's no way they could have achieved anything close to this without the active help of millions of quote unquote, ordinary people. So when you hear the saying, all that is, you've probably heard the saying before, but if you haven't, it's a common saying, um, all that is required for evil to flourish or to prevail is for good people to do nothing. 
I would, um, I would say that on the scale of the Holocaust, that that's not quite right. It's more like all that is required for uh, evil to prevail is for several million ordinary people to participate in the evil. As we will see, this concept of evil is one itself that we should examine, re-examine. And I'm going to suggest that it's actually ultimately an unhelpful and empty concept, um, and possibly even harmful. So that's why the focus of this talk is on ordinary, ordinariness, um, and the, the links that exist between the Holocaust and um, the, the situations that create um, and lead ordinary people to perpetrate violence. So, um, none of this is meant to be exculpatory of the Germans. Uh, the reality is, is that even though many non-Germans killed or assisted in the killing in some way, it was German policy and action that set it all in motion. Um, and Germans still had a hand in the majority of the killing. Non-Germans may have herded Jews into the gas chambers and locked the doors, but it was usually special, special, special SS commandos who dumped the cyanide crystals in the uh, vent holes from the roofs of the gas chambers so they could sublimate into deadly cyanide gas. And something that's not commonly known is the fact that the majority of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust were not actually killed in gas chambers. They were killed by firing squads in Eastern Europe, in Western Russia, and in the Baltics. It was here that the so-called task forces of the SS, the Einsatzgruppen, followed the initial wave of German army forces, which had cleared out the territory from the Red Army. The Einsatzgruppen moved stealthily along the country roads of mostly rural eastern Poland and western Russia, from town to town, rounding up the Jews, often with the help of locals, and marching them to the outskirts of the town, usually in a forest or a dale, having them dig their own graves, strip, and then shooting them. As Christopher Browning details in his uh, well-known work, this experience was up close and personal, not like the impersonal and mechanical killing of the gas chambers, which many SS guards did not actually have to witness firsthand. Here, shooters were assigned a Jew, and they would walk with them to the killing site. Sometimes they would chat, and talk about their families or their jobs before the war, exchange pleasantries. Sometimes the Jews would beg or cry or even try to bribe their executioners, which didn't usually work. The shooters to be trained by their unit physicians on how to most effectively um, execute their victims, which um, usually involved, although it's not reflected in these um, pictures, using their bayonet to line up their rifle with the base of the victim's skull. Um, inaccurate headshots could and did lead to brain and skin and skull splattering over their uniforms, which was considered unacceptable. One soldier, Browning, recounts volunteered to shoot all the babies and the toddlers. He said that because his colleagues were busy shooting the children's mothers, the children would be left to fend for themselves and would ultimately die. So he was being merciful um, because nobody would want to take in a Jewish orphan, so he was dispatching them quickly. The thing is, many of these um, many of these killers were not actually hardened, brainwashed soldiers of the Waffen SS. They were actually often men caught up in a massive paramilitary police apparatus that had been quickly, hastily created and consolidated under an office known as the Reich Main Security Office, which was led by SS um, Obersturmführer Reinhard Heydrich. Um, so Browning's work focuses on, on one example of some of these men, a group known as the Order Police, um, some of the more scenes of the Einsatzgruppen, you can go forward one more, the Order Police Battalion 101. Um, the Order Police uh, was a, a, a sort of a paramilitary unit that um, oftentimes received um, men who were too old to be drafted into the regular um, army units, um, but were still I mean, either in their mid-late 30s or their 40s or even their early 50s, still very much capable of being deployed um, for duty that um, involved combat against people who couldn't fight back, um, as opposed to 
uh, the real combat of fighting the Red Army. Um, most of the men of uh, Battalion 101 were from the city of Hamburg um, and uh, were in their 30s or later 40s. Um, far from being indoctrinated or brainwashed um, in Aryan beasts born and bred to conquer the world, they mostly were family men from middle class or lower middle class backgrounds. One of them owned a lumber business in Hamburg. Um, a number of them were in sales, and they were part of Hamburg's bustling uh, trade, commercial trade economy. There were some pharmacists, some teachers, and they were led by Major uh, Wilhelm Trepp, who was 53 years, 53 years old and had been a career policeman in Hamburg, in the Hamburg Police Department. So as Browning details, the members of Battalion 101 were anything but hardcore Nazis. In fact, when they were first deployed to the newly conquered eastern Polish town of Josefov, Trapp, for the first time, learned of the assignment that his unit had received from the SS commander in Poland, Odilo Gobracznik, um, which was to round up the Jews of Yosefov, march them outside the town to the forest, and kill them all. Trapp told the assembled unit of their orders, and he said that anyone who did not want to perform the task given to them could step forward and excuse themselves. Twelve men did out of roughly 500. They turned in their rifles, including the lumber business owner, and they were given alternate assignments for the day. Everyone else stayed for duty. As the unit deployed to begin the killings, Trapp stayed behind, unable to witness it himself. In his makeshift field headquarters, he burst into tears, he put his hand over his heart, and he wailed, why did I have to be given these orders? And he said, if this Jewish business is ever avenged on earth, then have mercy on us Germans. Many of those who volunteered for the killing still found it very difficult, and they tried to get out of it once it had begun. Some volunteered to fetch ammo or other supplies and loaded and unloaded the same truck over and over again. Others to stall for time. Others shot past their victims, hoping that their victims would catch the hint and fall down and lay dead um, to crawl out later when the coast was clear. Most of them at first refused to kill the children, actually, um, and simply wouldn't do it. A number of them cried after the day's duty was done, and most needed copious amounts of alcohol to blot out the memory of what they had done that day. As the days went on and the battalion moved on to other towns in eastern Poland for more killing, rustling up Polish vodka became the first order of the day before even um, forming um, the ranks for duty. A lot of these men needed to be blotto before they could even pull the trigger again. This, of course, led to all sorts of problems as the shooting started to become more inaccurate. Human remains splattering, and some victims not being killed, just horribly wounded, including a 10-year-old girl who Major Trapp interceded with and had uh, allowed to live after she had been shot inaccurately in the head and disfigured. Others um, reached their, their, their limit and vomited on themselves and ran away to hide in the woods by themselves. Again, Trapp never really visited most of the, the killing sites. He couldn't bear to watch his own orders being put into effect. A lot of the men couldn't sleep either. They would wake up screaming um, with nightmares, firing their guns in their sleep at the ceilings of their, their barracks. Still, as time went on, they uh, became more and more, the killing became more and more routinized. And um, even with all the ambivalence, even with um, all the um, difficulties they had, this unit of about 500 men managed in total to kill 83,000 Jewish men, women, and children. The experience of other units, including more heavily indoctrinated um, SS Einsatzgruppen units made of younger recruits, was similar. There was one thing to learn in the SS academies about the Jew as a stereotype. Um, but it was quite another to see a real living human being look into their eyes, listen to their begging and their pleas for mercy, and then blow their brains out anyway. Alcoholism, desertion, self-wounding, mental and emotional breakdowns became increasingly common, regardless of the units. By the January of 1942, when the shooting on the Eastern Front had been going on for a half a year and already claimed close to a million Jews, it became clear to Reinhard Heydrich and his right-hand man, Adolf Eichmann, 
that things could not continue in this way. Ordinary men were being ordered to kill ordinary men, women, and children. And it was causing a serious breakdown in discipline and readiness for duty. It was for this reason that at a conference called for top-level functionaries of the Third Reich in the Berlin suburb of Wannsee, Heydrich and Eichmann announced that they had decided to switch over to a more impersonal and much more efficient method of killing, namely the death camps utilizing poison gas. Of course, the question in all of this is why? Why would these ordinary people, these not Hollywood villains, not brainwashed, battle-hardened killing machines, but farmers, teachers, salesmen, office workers, delivery drivers, but a minimum of ideological indoctrination, or in the case of Eastern Europeans, had no in ideological indoctrination. Why would they suddenly turn into efficient and brutal killers, mass murderers? Browning claims that his research, which stems from the testimony of the trial of Battalion 101 in Frankfurt in 1963, shows that the men succumbed to peer pressure but not ordinary peer pressure, rather the extraordinary peer pressure of relying on your peers to survive. A unit of 500 men, relatively alone, far from home, far from headquarters, deep in enemy territory, was a vulnerable unit. Indeed, one of the greatest fears of the Germans on the Eastern Front wasn't the Red Army, it was the stealthy and lethal partisans who um, were had many of them had been units uh, of this were units of the, the former Soviet Communist Party organization um, that had gone underground on Stalin's orders, the famous Ukaz Stalinum, um, which was um, uh, an order that no Communist Party members were to surrender. They were to, if they found themselves behind enemy lines, they were to take off their uniforms, blend in with the population, and begin launching guerrilla asymmetrical warfare on the Germans which they did, and which was very, very effective, and led to a high death toll on the Germans. Um, so from the point of view of the men of Battalion 101, they might not like your orders, but to betray your unit by shirking your duty deep in enemy territory was a potentially life-threatening thing to do. In fact, um, Browning and many other historians trace the killing on the Eastern Front to an order given by Adolf Hitler that's known now as the Kommissar Befehl, the Kommissar Order. Um, this was, like so many of the Fuhrer's orders, not a, it was a cryptically worded statement rather than a legally binding policy document. Um, the reason Hitler uh, oftentimes gave orders in sort of cryptic phrases was plausible deniability. It's very possible that, possible that um, at least under American law, it would have been hard to convict Hitler of any of these crimes because he never actually directly ordered anybody to do it. But instead, he would say things like, any, um, in response to the partisan warfare, he would say, anyone who looks at our men or even uh, askance or even seems to be um, a member of the partisans should be shot immediately. The thing that's important to understand is that it was commonly understood in Germany, as well as in other places, um, that Jews and Bolshevism, Soviet communism, were intricately linked. So, killing the Jews was an act that the Germans did to be on the safe side. Um, they began uh, issuing orders or simply acting on their own to kill Jews, because if they were going to be partisans to ambush them, they'd probably be among the Jews. Kill all the Jews was the only way to be safe. And Hitler had given a green light, so it was clear no one would suffer any legal or career consequences for doing the killing. And Browning has also noted that, interestingly, every time that the war seemed to turn against Germany, um, the killing of Jews intensified. One of the most frequent justifications that Germans used, both in the Order of Police Battalion but in many other units um, on the front, for why the killing was okay was the horrific bombing of German civilians during the war in 1943, 44, and 45 by, by British, mostly British, and also American air forces. Um, these led to um, almost a million German civilians being killed, 
often in horrifying, gruesome ways, such as being cooked alive in their basements um, or melting into um, liquefying asphalt, just trying to flee from their burning homes. Um, in fact, one of the worst attacks was on Hamburg, which destroyed um, almost 50% of the city. Um, Hamburg was the hometown of many of the men in Battalion 101. And the, the rationale or the thought process wasn't so much a kind of an eye for an eye type of thing, like you bombed my hometown, now I'm going to kill your village. It was something much uh, deeper than that. From the beginning, Hitler had spoken of Germany's fight against the Soviet Union and the Jews in existential terms. Hitler was profoundly influenced by social Darwinism, and he saw the various races as being locked in a struggle for existence, like the different species on the African savanna fighting over control of the only watering hole on the plain. Only the strongest race would survive, claimed Hitler. As in the animal <coughs> kingdom, so too in the realm of geopolitics. Kill or be killed. Us versus them. And in a kill or be killed situation, to not kill is the crime because it signs the death warrant of the, those whom you love um, and call your family and your people. After all, the thinking went, would you preach pacifism or cooperation with an intruder about to slay your loved ones? In such a situation, Hitler said, to be soft-hearted is to be cruel. To be cruel is to be loving. This is why Heinrich Himmler gave a very well-documented speech to his top lieutenants in Posen as he unveiled the plans for the final solution, um, already anticipating the difficulties that his SS and assembled policemen, his ordinary men, would have in carrying out the mass murder of so many millions of ordinary victims. He acknowledged that the task would be hard. He acknowledged that it would turn their stomachs. He acknowledged that uh, every moral fiber in their beings might cry out to them to stop. But the extermination of the Jews had to be done, he said, and it had to be done by this generation at this time. A Fuhrer, like Hitler, he said, only comes along once every 2,000 years. Miss this chance, and you condemn generations of Germans to defeat at the hands of the Jews. Um, he was asking his men to become the Nazi version of the greatest generation not only to potentially sacrifice their lives in combat, but to sacrifice their own consciences, to take on guilt, to take on nightmares um, of the humans that they killed, knowing that that's ultimately what would serve the greater good. So Timothy Snyder, the, the historian I mentioned earlier, um, has recently argued, um, and again in a controversial book that got uh, bad reviews, but which I think is, is actually um, uh, misunderstood and, and quite a uh, good argument, that it's the chase for resources, especially land for resettlement and food, that was a critical part of the Nazi war on the Eastern Front and the Holocaust itself. Hitler was convinced that Germany was losing in the struggle for survival. It did not have overseas colonies like Britain and France. It had to buy much of its food from other countries. Hitler was, according to this line of thinking, essentially reenacting colonization, only this time in Eastern Europe and Russia. Hitler openly spoke in colonial terms, um, or oftentimes drew ideas or inspiration from the treatment of the American Indians in this country. He called the Volga River, which is the rough dividing line between we uh, Western and, and sort of far Eastern Russia, he called it our Mississippi. Indeed, many of the tactics that were used, that were um, uh, deployed by the Nazis, were not invented by them. Uh, it was the Spanish who invented the concentration camp. They called it Reconcentrada um, in Cuba to keep control of the rebellious Cuban mestizo population. The British also used concentration camps in their colonial empire. Um, concentration camps were essential to the strategy of, um, uh, of how a small minority of conquerors could keep control over a vast population many times greater than their own. You keep everybody in one place and then you can control them. Um, this is also deployed by the United States in the Philippines in the Philippine-American War. Um, the kinds of divide and conquer strategies that allowed a small minority 
of Europeans to gain control over vast populations of non-Europeans um, and creating situations of food and research, resource shortages that required conquered peoples to vie with each other for resources for tactics that had been developed by Britain, Belgium, France, Holland, and so on. Hitler was simply applying those same tactics to Russia, to Russians, Poles, and Jews. And so this is where I want to start to bring this back to our present situation. I've talked about two instances today in which ordinary people were transformed into brutal killers. In one example, Poles in the town of Yevabne knew that a hostile occupying force was arriving in their town, one that disliked them but hated their Jewish neighbors even more. Yet instead of offering an alliance and solidarity with the Jews, a united front to rise up against the numerically much smaller invaders, the Poles instead sought favor with their new overlords by turning on those deemed lower on the totem pole. This was, I would argue, a very rational move on their behalf. It was a situation in which their very survival was threatened, and their actions were made to ensure that their existence would continue, or at least it seemed from their point of view. After all, what would have been, what would have been better, to be on the Germans' good side or the Germans' bad side? In the other instance, we have the example of ordinary Germans, family men, businessmen, not heavily indoctrinated or sadistic killers. Yet here, too, 500 of them managed to kill 83,000 Jews face to face. Here, too, if we are to believe Browning's argument, the reason lies in the fact that they felt existentially threatened. They dared not disobey or desert their comrades in a place that was hostile to their lives. And they believed that the Jews were part of a larger war that from the beginning had been explained to them as what the Germans called a Vernichtungskrieg, a war of extermination in a war of extermination in which one of the two races would have to vanish from the earth. In such a situation, to not act to kill would be the true crime. So it was colonialism that showed the Nazis the way to impose control over a vast population. First, create a situation of resource shortage that will pit groups against each other. We see this in concentration camps. We see this in ghettos. We see it in colonized lands in Africa and Asia and South America, where some tribes were favored against others. Some groups were pitted against others, which allowed the, the, the colonial um, overlords to ensure that subordinate groups that should have been their enemies actually did their bidding. I think once you understand this, you can believe how ordinary people can become murderers. Now, Browning's work was attacked by another historian named Jonah, uh, Daniel Jonah Goldhagen, who used some of the same exact sources and some others, um, to argue in his book called Hitler's Willing Executioners that the Germans were uniquely guilty for the Holocaust, that they did not stumble unwillingly into a situation in which they simply had to kill, but that they, as a culture and as a nation, going back to Luther and even back to the Crusades, had a unique penchant and love for killing Jews. The Holocaust, according to Goldhagen, was really just an expression of the Germans' unique evil. His book sold many times more copies than Browning's book and earned Goldhagen well-paid speaking gigs all over the world. It's not surprising that so many people found it more pleasing to read an explanation of the Holocaust, which assured them that it could not happen here, and that as a non-German, none of us would ever be involved in such uh, atrocities. It was, it is, and it has been easy to label Nazis inhuman, animals, or just pure evil. And the recent march in Charlottesville, which I'll talk about in a second, brought the sheer strength and newfound power of, um, actually you can, um, of the neo-Nazi movement to the attention of mainstream America. Much of the commentary that I deserved was the same demonization. The, the participants were evil, or crazy, or un-American, simply outside the realm of understanding. And it's this line of thinking that I'm trying to argue to all that is very dangerous, perhaps the most dangerous of all. Every piece of research that we have, from the research, from the experiments done by Stanley Milgram um, uh, to um, the tests done on Adolf Eichmann during his trial in Jerusalem, um, and to the research of Christopher Browning, has shown that the Nazi killers were very much living, breathing, ordinary humans like all of us. The marchers in Charlottesville chanted, you will not replace us, and Jews will not replace us. Um, oftentimes the alt-right uses the popular hashtag, white genocide. 
Um, they're, when they do that, they're reflecting a similar philosophy that was voiced by Hitler many decades ago, that there is a struggle for survival of the races. And anyone who doesn't see that, especially white people, are blind. Any white person who preaches solidarity between the races is the worst, because they're like someone who is not willing to defend their own family against an intruder. Um, That's why the alt-right loves the derogatory term cuck. Um, this is because resources are scarce. There's not enough to go around. There's not enough food, there's not enough land, there's not enough money. In this country, it's precisely that kind of thinking that has underpinned racism. For so many, especially on the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, being white was the one advantage that they had. No matter how down on, on your luck you were, no matter how poorly off you were, if you were white, at least you weren't on the very lowest rung. To lose that one advantage, if indeed you believe that resources were scarce and there wasn't enough pie to go around for everyone, would be an existential threat. That's why so many poor whites fought for the Confederacy to keep blacks enslaved and never made common cause with them. When people, when they hear people say all races are equal, they hear, you will now lose the one advantage you had and now your family will starve. That's also why Polish villagers who also were only one rung up from the bottom of the ladder, turned on their Jewish neighbors and massacred them, doing the Germans' work for them in the hopes of gaining German favor, instead of realizing that both they and their, German, and their Jewish neighbors were despised by the Germans and making common cause with their Jewish neighbors to fight back. So the lesson of this look at the motivations of ordinary people in the Holocaust, I feel, is this, that you should beware of any worldview that claims that people are inherently in competition with each other for scarce resources. Beware of us versus them, kill or be killed type of thinking. Beware of any kind of existential thinking, by which I mean any statements or political philosophies that claim that there is an existential threat. It's these modes of thought that lead ordinary people to become killers in the 1940s and in the future. Thank you very much. for some questions. Um, yes. So what do you do? <laughs> um, I mean, how do you argue with, with that kind of thinking, mm -hmm. that emotion that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but I do, I do know that it's important to not be sucked into that kind of thinking and not try to think or argue on the, on the assumptions that they make, which is that there is, um, which is that, for example, if, you know, we, we will become a majority, you know, minority country, white people will be in the minority in this country, um, that that doesn't represent some kind of threat. I would say to simply, if you get the chance, if you want to go up on March 5th in uh, East Lansing and get in a conversation with somebody, to ask them what they're so afraid of. Because, you know, one of the greatest rebukes to Hitler, you have to understand, Hitler, um, when his days were drawing to a close, um, decided to kill himself uh, because he truly believed there was nothing worth living for in an occupied Germany. And in his last will and testament, he blamed the German people for being weak in the struggle of the races and grudgingly praised the Slavic Russians for being the stronger race um, and then predicted that all would be lost, everything would be destroyed. Um, he gave his Nazi lieutenants explicit orders to blow up every bridge, every dam, every factory, every, every rail line, everything to completely destroy and, uh, and uh, obliterate their own country because they saw no possible future. But as we know, and actually most of my research um, is focused on the post-1945 period, Germany continued on. And as, as a matter of fact, at least the western part of Germany became one of the most stable, and successful um, economically and politically democracies in the world. We could take a lesson from them, honestly, on how to run a democracy. Um, the you know 95% voter turnout um, and um, you know election campaigns that don't last for two years long. You know what I'm saying? Like, like actually, not only did they, not only was there indeed a future after supposedly the catastrophe happened. Um, 
there was a really good future. So, you know, this idea of, you know, if you asked a Nazi soldier who was fighting, you know, the Americans crossing the Rhine, why are you fighting? What are you so afraid of? What do you think is going to happen when the Americans take over? It's a thought that most of them hadn't really entertained. They just didn't really think about it. It just was this sort of blank catastrophe looming. Um, and if you, of course, could have had a time machine to take them forward to the 1950s or the 70s or the 90s and show them, like, it's, it's much better this way without the Nazis, this, you know, they would have been obviously much less motivated to fight. And so I guess, you know, that's the only thing I can say is, you know, the demographics of this country will change. Um, it will not be the end of whatever sort of culture or race or whatever it is that these people are so afraid of that they're going to lose. There will still be jobs, there will still be futures, there will still be money to be made, houses to be bought, friends to hang out with, you know. It's, it's, it's this fear and this idea that their whiteness is what's responsible for them having a future. You know, and in, in a way, it's a, it's a way of weakening yourself to say that the only thing that's, that's worthwhile about me is the color of my skin, as opposed to saying, I could probably get a good job and marry somebody that I love and have a happy life in a multiracial society, regardless of, of skin color. So that's my best answer to you. But obviously, you know, it's a very, very difficult, it's a very difficult task. Yeah? You still have Nazis in Germany today, I can see them. Who see the prosperity? Yes. Well, you have the the you have some neo Nazis skinheads, um, and you have the AfD, the, the the alternative for for Deutschland, the alternative for Germany party, which is not a Nazi party, but um, explicitly and unreservedly um, stands with logos like our nation, our homeland. Um, uh, very clearly um, to um, push back against non-white, uh, not just non-German, but non-white um, immigrants being brought in. Um, uh, but again, there I would say that, you know, one of Angela Merkel's reasonings and justifications, sort of two justifications for inviting, frankly, millions of Syrian refugees into Germany permanently one is that um, Germans, you know, committed such terrible crimes against humanity that they owe a debt to the rest of humanity. And um, ever since World War II, West Germany at least has had a very, very, the most um, lenient and liberal asylum law in the country um, and has welcomed a lot of different refugees. But also because Germany, like a lot of European nations, has a problem. It's a social welfare state. Um, and as you know, if you're, you know, like in this country, for example, you, you know, we have Medicare, we have Social Security, that means for the people who are no longer working and receiving those benefits, there have to be a sizable number of people who are working and paying taxes to support that. You start to have more seniors than you have young people, you have a problem. And that's exactly what Germany and a lot of these European countries have, which is an inverted pyramid because of a low birth rate. Um, and Angela Merkel's other line of reasoning was that, that you need like more young people, doesn't matter if they're Syrians or what they are, to be working and paying taxes so that you can continue to enjoy your very um, generous social welfare state benefits in your golden years. Um, and, you know, I would submit that's still a view supported by the majority of Germans, but, um, you know, that's that's an argument that doesn't, that doesn't comport with with a certain section of the of the population. Yeah. So as a Jew of German and Austrian descent, I'm all aware of the fate of the Jews of Germany during her life. And um, I understand from women in Africa left Germany before the mass killing began, which is contrasted with the fate of the rest of the Jews of Europe at that time when they were enslaved and they were killed. Um, can you explain a little bit why the Nazi government allowed its Jews to emigrate? If, you know, when they invaded the Soviet Union, when they invaded the rest of Europe, they tried to kill as many people as they could who were of Jewish descent, but they allowed their own citizens to get out of Dodge. Can you explain why there were these different approaches? Was it a financial reason? Um, or, 
It's both. Um, it's, it's also about timing. Um, what you're talking about was official um, German policy um, about making the Reich Judenfrei, meaning free of Jews, until um, the war began in September of 1939 was a policy of um, encouraging emigration. Before 1939, Germany didn't have control over Eastern Europe or over France or Belgium or those other countries. So um, that's why a lot of German and Austrian Jews were able to get out. Germany had control over Austria as of um, spring of 1938 onward. So, and actually Adolf Eichmann's job had been, um, from Vienna, Austria, his job was to make contacts with and get to know the Jewish community in Vienna to help them make arrangements to emigrate. Um, but once the war started, um, Reich citizens emigrating was a problem because they could go to the United States or Britain or France and betray secrets. And I've seen documents that bear this out in the military ar archives of the OSS, the predecessor to the CIA, um, in Washington, in which a lot of our um, espionage and bombing military strategy was based on the um, reconstructions of facilities, bridges, roads, um, by uh, emigres, often German Jewish emigres, that had made their way to either London, New York, or Washington, and we got in touch with them and sat them down and say, we're interested in, we know you used to work in this town, we're interested in everything you can remember, draw us a map of this town, where are the headquarters, where's the bridge, you know, as best as you can from memory, and they try to link that up with other, you know, intelligence they had, and that's how, that's how we bombed Germany. So there was a real, real uh, found, well-founded reason not to let Jews emigrate after 1930, September 1st, 1939. Yeah. So um, in the United States, we have this strong legal basis for free speech, demonstrations like that, and dispensers coming to speak. A lot of European countries, particularly Germany, I know, restrict things like that. For most of my life, I've always thought it's better to let the wacko nuts speak because most normal people will realize they're wacko nuts and not follow them. But as these, this right, alt-right is expanding and expanding, and kind of realizing the potential, the flaw in the human brain to become, I don't know, for lack of a better word, brainwashed and drawn into these mass movements, I sometimes wonder whether the system that we have here is the best system for handling it. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts, you know, comparatively on that, how some European countries have handled that free speech issue versus how it is in the United States. Yeah, that's, that's a really tough question, too. Um, it's not true that um, Germany prevents um, neo-Nazis from marching. Um, they have, um, they, they banned the Nazi party from ever being reconstituted. At times, they also banned the Communist Party from being constituted, and um, at times, other far-right uh, white nationalist or neo-Nazi parties, um, uh, one called the NPD, for example, um, they, uh, you know, they've been banned and then they were allowed to exist again and then they were banned. Um, but I've personally been to um, witness uh, marches of neo-Nazis in Berlin. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it creates the same kind of dynamic as here because any time they do that, of course, a large crowd of Antifa, Antifa is a German word. Um, actually, and the, the Antifa movement began in Germany precisely because of the counter neo-Nazi marches in Germany. And I've seen what happens when the police have a constitutional duty to protect the neo-Nazis and they end up fighting with the Antifa, making them look like they're, they're Nazis too. Um, and my fear is that the same dynamic happens here. Now you will have uh, Richard Spencer, Richard Spen Spencer and his um, followers um, uh, speaking, and then a lot of counter-protesters show up and begin fighting with the police, and it makes them look good, and their opponents look bad. And this is this is what this was a big secret to the rise of the Nazi Party. You know, I remember, you know, finding a, a, a memoir from a, a woman who was a, a, like a nine or ten, eleven-year-old girl um, in the 1930s, or in the, in the early 1930s before the Nazis took power, but when both the Nazi and the communist movement were on the rise in, um, in Germany, and, you know, knowing very little about politics, she noted that the, when the communists demonstrated through the street in her town, they looked kind of disorganized and ragtag, and, 
you know, poor. And when the Nazis marched, they all had pristine uniforms and marched in lockstep. And so she thought, I know which one I'm supporting. You know, these guys look like they have their act together. I like them. You know, so, yeah. So when I heard some of the responses to Richard Spencer, or any time any of those people speak, is to sign up to the and then walk out. Your attention, please. Or, the like, library. so for everyone in this room to show up at Richard Spencer's talk, plus everyone that we know, so fill the auditorium, and then when he gets up and starts talking, we all leave, is one of the responses. Because we, we don't, if you don't want to fight free speech, it's a slippery slope. Or we host events like what you're doing here, and on campus at the same time, instead of protesting. So we, like, have an educational forum and a different building where hundreds of us go and we listen to talks like this and we get educated um, and we don't give them that publicity and that attention. But like, So there are different responses that people are working on the grassroots level to try to counter what they're doing in, in non-violent ways. So um, I personally like the idea of signing up to go and then leaving with an empty auditorium of like two or, you know, 20, 30 people that really want to be there. But, you know, that just takes organizing in a way that I'd like to speak to that because back in the 60s, we had George Lincoln Rocco come to the college, and um, the way that he was the American Nazi leader back in the 60s, and what we did is everybody who went to the auditorium listened to him, but nobody was going to ask that question. As soon as he was done speaking, we all walked out. Was, he pissed. He said, <laughs> during the question period, then violence starts. And so there was no question period. And it just emptied out. And, and it, it, was, it was an interesting time to get word to us. We could hear what he had to say. It was quite scary. I think the evolution of how we get our information these days has some contribution or some aid to groups like this in the sense that, you know, so much news is kind of gathered through social media or sites where, you know, people are reading what they want to hear as opposed to some common source of information you have in the past, whether it be newspaper or whatever, you know, that has some bearing in the growth of yeah, it worries me quite a bit, as a matter of fact, because um, the, um, the idea of a sort of central authoritative news source, the way we used to have, you know, I still remember when I was little of, you know, you know one, one town newspaper, um, you know, one, maybe one or two, you know, and then the nightly news on TV in one of the three networks. Um, uh, you know, was, is, uh, was something that existed for just a sort of distinct period of time. It wasn't always like that. In, in Germany, in other countries, um, in the 1930s, in the 1920s, in the 19-teens, you had a similar phenomenon to what you're describing. You had newspapers that were read by Nazis and only, you know, described the events of the world through the eyes of a Nazi. There were newspapers that were read by communists and that were, you know, newspapers read by people who are more left of center or right of center. Um, even to this day in, in Europe, um, you know, you know, people in this country oftentimes on the right complain about a left-wing bias in the media. People on the left complain that Fox News is too biased to the right. People from Europe and frankly from Asia and other countries say, that's normal. You know, like I only read, you know, if you're a sort of like wealthier, right of center type person, you read the Frankfurt or Allgemeine Zeitung. If you're a more left-wing, radical type, you know, you read the Targus Zeitung in, in Berlin. You know what I mean? Like everybody has that so you know who somebody is by what newspaper they're holding. Um, and and yet, you know, as I said, West Germany especially, but even to this day, Germany itself has been has proven itself to be one of the most stable democracies with far more of a commitment to human rights, um, democratic rights, frankly, than in this country. Um, so there, there is hope. There is a way to get around it. Yeah. Excellent talk, by the way. Thank you. But I would like to put a final point on the warm and fuzzy place that pagan racism is. 
So when Holocaust survivors went back to some of those small towns in Poland, uh, they were murdered. Yep. A lot of them were murdered in 1945. <coughs> um, a lot of the reason that people didn't uh, uh, identify with the Germans, identify with the marching Nazis rather than the marching communists, because the communists are a lot of Jews. They were a lot of Jews in the communist party, not so many in the Nazi party. Um, and so I think, you know, in addition to good people not doing nothing, I think good people have to be able to recognize racism for what it is and anti-Semitism for what it is, because it's still it's there. And there's all these code words uh, that, that people use when they talk about bankers and so, you know, they, and so forth, and the people who control the press and so forth. They're talking about Jews, so let them off. Uh, so I think that we need to be, to be on our guard, and not paranoid, but certainly on our guard for these things, and call them what they are. Yeah, I think that's true, uh, but um, just to follow up with that, you know, the Red Army, certainly it had, uh, uh, in, this, in the Soviet you know, Union and the Communist Party, had Jews in it, um, but to some degree that was just because there were a lot of Jews who lived in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was actually one of the, probably the most ethnically diverse um, country ever on earth. I mean, there were, you know, Muslims and Kazakhs and Mongolians and, you know, um, Native peoples related to Eskimos. Um, I mean, you know, everybody was, you know, was incredibly diverse. It still is that whole area. Um, and when you when you saw units of the Red Army roll in, they reflected that it was a multiracial state. Communism preached, of course, that you know that race um, didn't matter, and the only thing that mattered was your class. So um, that um, that plus the Jew, you know, the the Jews, the prominent Jews, was really what horrified. Poles were horrified. A lot of people about about it was this idea of a um, a world uh, in which all the races would be mixed up. But I mean, you're right in everything you're saying. I just want to add on to that point when you said about the you know, when you talked about the Jews being part of the Soviet Union. I believe the head of the German Communist Party in the 30s is Jewish. Um, you know, that's a, I actually don't know if Tailman was Jewish. Um, the, the leaders who had led it up to a point and then were killed in 1919 were Jewish, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. It's very small. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, very it's small. small. But they have a cost. So now right. they have a different demographic. They're successful, but they have a great loss. Mm -hmm. right. And you bring up, actually, you're touching on a really, really, really important point that should um, come as a sort of uh, corrective to my <coughs> talking about how successful Germany is. You could also say that Norway and Denmark have been incredibly successful. Um, you know, in Sweden, and frankly, a lot of, you know, countries even like Poland since the fall of communism have been very successful. One of the things, though, about all those countries that, that is that, as I think you're hinting at, is that they're 99% white and ethnically homogenous. Um, Poland used to be something like 80% Polish, 10% Jewish, 8%, you know, Ukrainian or Russian, there were Germans, there were Hungarians who lived in there. There were gypsies. There were all kinds of people who lived in there. The Germans cleaned all those people out and left just the Poles. Now you have a Poland that's 98%, 99% Polish. Um, and, and in some ways, it's easier when you don't have to deal with questions of race. In this country, we deal with race all the time. Or sometimes we don't, but it's still there, um, waiting to be dealt with. And um, in a way, these countries like Denmark or Hungary or Germany haven't had to deal with it. Now, all of a sudden, show up, you know, two, three million Syrians, Iraqis, you know, uh, Somalians trying to save their own lives by coming to get safe haven in Europe and suddenly this very stable democracy is starting to fall apart. So, I mean, that's, that's the other way to look at it. Yeah. Initially, when we were talking about the 50 million Jews that took the village, you said many of them uh, resigned the language 
Uh, so we try to blend in. We try to dress like, etc., etc. Uh, as we look at the big picture of immigration and the numbers that we're dealing with, not only in those countries, but potentially in our own country, where there are large groups that come in and insist on remaining together. Uh, and look at the man at how does the immigration process work well without a certain amount of assimilation, particularly the girls who are yeah, um, so the Jewish uh, example there is a little bit different because, you know, Jews have lived in this region for easily 500 years, um, and, um, uh, and, and in Germany as well, um, in some cases um, even longer than 500 years, um, 1,000 years. Uh, um, some parts of Europe, they've lived there for 2,000 years. So they weren't immigrants, um, but they had lived sort of a separate life. They developed a separate language, which was a blend of Hebrew, German, and Polish called Yiddish. Um, they dressed differently. They had different laws, different schools, different everything. There was no intermarriage, so on and so forth. Um, and so in the 1800s, in the wake of the Enlightenment, a movement began that Jews should try to assimilate. Both Germans thought this and sort of Jews thought it. and so. They shaved their beards, they wore suits and ties, they spoke German, not Yiddish, they, some of them even converted to um, Protestantism. You know, I mean, they, they did everything to blend in. Your attention, please. The library will be closing in eight minutes. Are we going to stop? Thank you. Uh, you okay, so, um, so, they, so, yeah, so they did blend in um, uh, and became, you know, really great contributors to German culture and composers and writers and scientists, um, Albert Einstein comes to mind, um, and it didn't help them. For a lot of them, that was what they thought would help them, that if you not only blend in, but distinguish yourself, become a great scientist, become a great composer, Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi, um, or um, a great, um, you know, uh, a businessman like uh, Walter Rathenau, um, then people will respect you finally. Or what they found is that if they remained separate and poor, people hated them because they were, they didn't assimilate and they were dirty and poor and a drain on resources. And if they blended in and became successful, then people hated them because they were taking over the country. So, you know, it presents a real problem. Um, frankly, this is where the idea of the state of Israel came that you're just never going to be able to assimilate in anybody else's country. You have to have your own. That's a whole other discussion for another time. Yes. So we, I'm happy to stick around and answer some more questions.